So our next speaker is ready to get started. I'm happy to introduce to you uh, Daniel Rave from Tel Aviv University. And I think we are completely changing from the Turkey and the Ottoman Empire now to the India. I see Ramchandra Gandhi. Ramchandra Gandhi, by the way, is the grandson of Gandhi. Ah, okay. <laughs> the grandson of Sandy, Martin Buber, and uh, yes, you see Magnus in conversation with the Mahatma. So we are completely changing the horizon, going to India and maybe even to other continents. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon. Um, so I'm the Gandhi guy. How can we have a, a conference on nonviolent resistance without Gandhi? Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers, especially Elisa Atzberger, for inviting me. Second, I don't have a demonstration t-shirt, but I wanted to say that I'm extremely sad that the theme of the conference is far these days from being theoretical. We are currently facing, and many of us take part in a nonviolent resistance, resistance movement aiming to preserve democracy in Israel. The following lines are written as part of the political need to open our eyes rather than burying our heads in the sand as usual. As a human or Israeli reflex, soberly depicted by Fram Sidon and Danny Kerman in their, in their 2018 children's book for adults, Be'eretz Yanki. Be'eretz Yanki. Third, the phrase nonviolent resistance brings to mind Gandhi. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the famous Mahatma. In the following paragraphs, I will discuss Gandhi's position conveyed by the Hindi phrases Ahinsa and Satyagraha, nonviolence and truthfulness in action, in dialogue with Ram Chandra Gandhi, his grandson and commentator and one of the most significant voices of contemporary Indian philosophy, and with two Jewish thinkers based in Jerusalem who wrote to him in 1939, challenging the universality of Ahinsa nonviolence. I'm talking about Martin Buber and Yudale Magnus. I did not refer to them as Israeli thinkers since the state of Israel was, was then yet to be established. In an article in the Harijan, his journal, on 30th November 1938, bed timing on Gandhi's behalf owing to the proximity to the Crystal Nacht, he addresses the issue of the Jews in Europe under the Nazi boot and their aspiration for a national home. I do not know if Gandhi was aware of the brutal events of the Crystal Night. My, my sympathies, he writes, I'm quoting Gandhi, are all with the Jews. I have known them intimately in South Africa. Some of them became lifelong co companions. Through these friends, I came to learn much of their age-long persecution. They have been the untouchables of Christianity. The parallel between their treatment by the Christians and the treatment of the untouchables by Hindus is very close. Religious sanction has been invoked in both cases for the justification of the inhuman treatment meted out to them. Apart from the friendships, therefore, there is, there is the more common universal reason for my sympathy for the Jews. The untouchables of Christianity, I'm asking, Gandhi translates the situation of the Jews in Europe into Indian terms that his readers and him are more familiar with. But he forgets, he forgets that historically Christianity originated from Judaism. Moreover, anti-Semitism is not, as against the exploitative caste system of India, a matter of, so, a, a matter, sorry, of social injustice. Gandhi continues, but my sympathy, but my sympathy does not blind me to the requirements of justice. The cry for the national home for the Jews does not make much appeal to me. Why should they not, like other peoples of the earth, make that country their home where they are born and where, and where they earn their livelihood? Again, a, pro a problematic paragraph 
Does not history play any role? Doesn't Gandhi know that the dream, why cry, to return to Israel is based on historical claim? And regarding the adoption of one's country, of birth as one's homeland, this is a complex issue, especially today, in today's world of immigration, relocation, dislocation, displacement, a world of migrants, refugees, exile, exiles, and unhomed. Gandhi continues, Palestine belongs to the Arabs in the same sense that England belongs to the English or France to the French. You know, the persecution of the Jews in Europe under the Nazi regime, he writes, if there, if there ever could be a justifiable war in the name of and for humanity, a war against Germany to prevent the persecution of the whole, of the whole race, would be completely justified. But I do not believe in any war. A discussion of the pros and cons of such a war is therefore outside my horizon or province. Um, okay, I'm skipping a bit because the time is short and I'm coming to, to, I'm coming to Buber's uh, re response to, to, to Gandhi. So Buber and Magnus, I will, I will, I will speak about Magnus in, in a minute. Uh, Martin Buber and Yudale Magnus wrote letters to Gandhi in 1939. And I'm quoting first from Buber. These words Buber writes to Gandhi, namely Gandhi's uh, words, are inspired by most praiseworthy general principles. But the listener, Buber, is aware that the speaker, Gandhi, has cast no, not a single glance at the situation which he is addressing. Buber calls Gandhi's article tragicomic and asks Gandhi in fury, are you not aware of the burning of synagogues and scrolls of the law? Do you know or do you not know, Mahatma, what, what a concentration camp is like and what goes on there? Do you know of the torments in the concentration camp, of its methods of slow and quick slaughter? I cannot assume that you know of this. You have to understand, I'm telling you, that Buber and Magnus admired Gandhi and were therefore disappointed by his remarks. In their letters, they show acquaintance with, with Gandhian terminology and use freely terms like, again, Ahinsa and Satyagraha. I'm interested in their letters owing to their philosophical dimension. Both Buber and Magnus challenge the universality of Ahinsa, which Gandhi advocates, Ahinsa nonviolence. Buber agrees with Gandhi that nonviolence is indeed preferable in most cases, but suggests that there are extreme cases in which it is hardly effective. Such a case, he argues, is the Nazi regime. Buber, in fact, implies that in some cases, a quantum of ad harma, of violence, is needed to protect and restore the dharma, perpetual peace, if I may employ the title of Kant's work as a translation of this old Sanskrit notion, Dharma. Yudalev Magnus, in his own letter to the Mahatma, challenges the universality of Ahimsa on different grounds. According to him, in order to use Ahimsa as an effective weapon, nonviolence as weapon, as Gandhi did, one needs to be indifferent to death, as Gandhi, in Magnus's eyes, was. Gandhi treated plague patients, and there was no cure for this fatal disease. And his numerous fasts unto death further illustrate this indifference. But the Jews, Magnus writes, now I'm quoting Magnus, are a people who exalt life, and they can hardly be said to disdain death. For this reason, I have often wondered if we are fit subjects for Satyagraha. This is an interesting argument. The precondition of Satyagraha rooted in Ahinsa is indifference to death. Magnus, a Jewish rabbi, further quotes the famous Mishnaic phrase, Kol nefesh achat, kilu olam umlo'o, further quotes in his letter to Gandhi, whoever saves a single soul saves the whole world, as to emphasize the value of life for the Jews, implying, and I think that at this point he misunderstood Gandhi, that indifference to death or willingness to die, such as Gandhi's, undermines the value of life. It is exactly the contrary, Ramchandra Gandhi argues, Gandhi's grandson and commentator. It is life in the face of death, 
if one is willing to face death, rather than repressing the inevitability, its inevitability, which injects life into life. My time is short, my time is short, right? But I wish to touch briefly on Ram Chandra Gandhi's reply to Gruber in the chapter, Is Ahinsa Nonviolence, from his 1984 book, I Am Thou. I Am Thou. His dialogue with Gruber, primarily through his magnum opus, I and Thou, is implied in the very title. Ram Chandra wants to take the solidarity conveyed by Gruber's phrase, I and Thou, one step ahead. For him, it is not just a matter of converting the other from it to thou, from laz to ata, it's Vivo Slavsky's Hebrew translation, but of standing together as one. In Ahinsa, in, in his paper, is Ahinsa, Ahinsa Nonviolence, Ram Chandra points out that we all, points out what we all know, but tend to forget, namely that any act of violence toward the other affects the aggressor as well. Likewise, nonviolence encompasses aggressor and aggressee together. But Ram Chandra further stresses that the translation of Ahimsa as nonviolence is misleading. It is not the opposite of violence, he suggests, despite the negative prefix a ah, in Sanskrit. It is rather the conclusion of a deep reflection on violence and its harmful consequences, violence that according to him is part and parcel of each and every one of us. Gandhi, I did not tell you, never answered the letters, Bubers and uh, Magnus says. Shimon Lev, author of Soulmates, the story of Mahatma Gandhi and Herman, Herman Kalinbach from 2012, told me that the letters must have reached Sabramati Ashram, Gandhi's Ashram. But for some reason, were not read by Gandhi, who when asked about them by Louis Fisher, his biographer and Magnus's friend, could not remember such, let such letters at all. Ram Chandra must have read them, they were published on different stages. My contention is that he answers them in place of his illustrious grandfather on the pages of his last major works. Gandhi's willingness to face death on numerous occasions, occasions from South Africa onwards, Ram Chandra saw as the rare capacity to make life a matter of choice, and moreover, to ascertain the I am thouness. I'm playing with his title, I am thou, to ascertain the I am thouness that connects even assassin and assassinated. Gandhi found his death, I'm sure that you all know, at the hand of an assassin in January 1948. This is Ram Chandra's answer to Magnus. As for Buber, who argued that in extreme, in extreme cases a measure of violence is needed, I was surprised to discover that Ram Chandra agrees with him. He acknowledges cases not just of unjustified violence, but also of unjustified nonviolence, as he puts it. He returns to his grandfather's reading of the Bhagavad Gita, the famous uh, classical Indian text, and suggests that fighting the Kauravas the villains of the narrative, let's call them without getting into the details, which he refers to as the Nazis of antiquity. This is why I think that he read the, he read Google. So he refers to the, to the quote unquote villains of this classical Indian text as the Nazis of antiquity. And he says that, he says that, he says that what? Eh, 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 eh. That not that, sorry, that fighting the Kauravas, fighting them, is an act of justified violence, which falls under the category of ahimsa. Not to act against them, against them, he explains, would be harmful both for those who suffer under their brutal rule and for them, since they too are the victims of their own brutality. But who will decide what is justified or unjustified? Who will decide who are the quote-unquote villains and good guys of the epic narrative? And likewise of our story here today. Ram Chandra assumes that deep down, each of us knows the answer. Presuming that the clear-cut borderline distinguishes between dharma and adharma, good and bad. Take for instance Duryodhana, the villain of the villains in the Mahabharata, a second generation of blindness not sight-wise like his father, but heart-wise, who honestly confesses, 
I know what dharma is, what the good is. This is the villain. But I have no inclination for it. I know what adharma is, but I cannot resist, resist it. This popular verse from the Stotra Pandava Gita suggests that the villain knows what the good is, even if he refuses to follow it. But my fear is that the idea of the good from Plato and Vyasa, the author of the Mahabharata onwards, is not as clear cut as Ram Chandra believes. Moreover, the good is not given and waiting to be revealed or retrieved. It is rather a matter of, social, of a social contract to be negotiated and maintained with great effort. Finally, does nonviolent resistance work? Did it work for Gandhi, for India? It is difficult to assess what was the weight of Gandhi's contribution to the termination of the British Raj in India, his role in the campaign against the colonial rule, against the colonial rule, glorified in Richard Attenborough's 1982 Oscar winning film, was certainly a factor. The British involvement in World War II was also a significant factor. They no longer had the resources to maintain the colonies. But how did it work? The Indigo Satyagraha in Champaran, Bihar in 1917, the famous Salt March in March 1930, the numerous hunger strikes, often director, directed not at the British, but to stop communal violence, namely mutual Hindu-Muslim violence. What was the mechanics, the how and why of this nonviolent resistance? In closure, I will offer a quick philosophical answer. The Yoga Sutra, a classical Indian text that Gandhi was acquainted with, he tells us in his 1925 autobiography, suggests that, I'm translating Yoga Sutra 235, in the presence of a yogi, a practitioner of yoga, not uh, asana yoga, not uh, physical yoga, and, I mean, uh, in the presence of a yogi, a practitioner, if you want, of meditation, firmly established in ahimsa, non-violence, violence ceases. In the presence of a yogi firmly established in ahimsa, violence ceases. Firmly established in ahimsa, yeah. Non-violence, uh, non violence ceases. Vyasa, the most authoritative commentator of the text, clarifies that the phrase vairatyaga in this verse, abandonment of hostility, violence ceases, I translated, takes place in every living creature. The commentators after him, it's a text with commentary upon commentary, etc. The commentators after him go as far as to suggest that cobra and mongoose, natural enemies, are no longer hostile to one another in the presence of a yogi immersed in ahimsa. This is to say that for the commentators, this verse that I quoted and translated is not an ethical maxim, but a law of nature. In the presence of a nonviolent yogi, there is no violence, whether in a human being, cobra or mongoose. Along similar lines, Gandhi writes, religious books tell us that when man becomes pure in heart, the lamb and the tiger will, will live like friends. So long as in our own selves, there is a conflict between the tiger and the lamb, is it any wonder that there should be a similar conflict in this world body? We but mirror the world, all the tendencies present in the outer present, sorry, in the outer world are to be found in the world of our body. If you could change yourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. Last paragraph. Gandhi speaks here not of the mongoose and the cobra, but of lamb and tiger. The book of Isaiah speaks of wolf and lamb leopard and kid. The cobra mongoose illustration is stronger because the animosity between them is reciprocal. According to Gandhi, every external animosity or conflict reflects an inner one, an inner one. If we can resolve our inner conflicts, external conflicts will consequently come to an end. He sees an intrinsic relation, intrinsic relation between self, even body and the world. In September 1947, Gandhi traveled to Calcutta to, and started to fast in order to stop the violent Hindu-Muslim clash in the city. This self-sacrifice worked. 
the riots stopped. In a conference celebrating Gandhi's 150th birth anniversary, in this very university in 2019, my colleague Yohanan Grinspon of the Hebrew University referred to Gandhi's fasts to change the world, fast to change the world as act of megalomania. But does not every world changer need at least a spark of megalomania or at least relentless optimism to believe that he can move mountains? Thank you. <laughs>